Let's look at five great knives from history. Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiator. Now in this video we're going to look at five great, as I consider them, knives and daggers from history. Indeed I've lumped knives and daggers together, daggers really a subset of knives, and these are my personal choices for the purposes of this video for a bunch of personal reasons. There are some other great knives and daggers which surely if we made a bigger list should be in there. Definitely the Roman Pugio, the Japanese Tanto, which are both, there you go, spoilers, not in this list. But nevertheless, I've picked on five where I have original antique examples that I can show and talk about of knives that I believe that if you're interested in the history of knives, or indeed just in modern knife design as well, if you watch shows like Forged in Fire or anything like that, you should be aware of these knives because they're very important in their time and in their context. And they've also influenced a lot of other knife designs out there. Also, I have to um, specify, of course, I'm talking about fighting knives here, not necessarily, you know, kitchen knives or wood carving knives or any other kind of knives. I'm specifically talking about knives that have been used in history as weapons, even if these days they might be viewed more as art objects and collected as uh, antiques or things to put on the wall. In the past, they had an important part to play in the warfare of the area and period that they come from. As always, I'm very happy to hear your comments underneath this video as well about what knives would you like to see me cover in the future or what you have preferred to see in this video, in fact. Uh, so your feedback and comments are always welcome. Remember, knives are not toys and don't go around harming anybody with them, but they are fascinating, culturally, historically important objects, which is very, very worthwhile that we study and understand the place that they They've played in the building of the societies that we live in today. Before I go on, I want to mention a game to you who are the sponsors for this video, and it's a game that features lots of weapons, including knives and daggers, swords, bows, spears, everything like that. And our kind sponsors for this video are Raid Shadow Legends. Raid is a turn-based fantasy combat game where you get to develop your champions, pick their armor, pick their weapons, make them tougher, and make the ultimate team to win. Now it's no coincidence that I'm holding a Wakazashi because Raid have just introduced an amazing new faction that I'm actually really excited about and they look awesome. And they're called the Shadow Kin. Remember Raid's free to download, free to play, and you can use my links below to download it yourself right now for either your mobile phone or your PC. As you can see, the Shadowkin are heavily influenced by medieval Japan, along with a load more Eastern Asian influence. They've got nimble ninjas, sharp samurai, ominous oni, and a whole load of mythical badasses. These guys are shrouded in mystery. No one's heard from them for hundreds of years until just a few months ago when they revealed themselves as allied with the dwarves in the Nyresian Union. And why now? They've only just arrived, so get ready to meet the new members as they arrive in the game. Are they good? Are they bad? Why have they returned? Here's probably my favourite character in the new Shadowkin, and his name's Jintoro, and he's got awesome samurai armour with really cool um, helmet up there, uh, Kabuto, and he seems to have a Odashi sword uh, with spiky bits on it. As you guys know, what I love most about playing this game is the person versus person battles in the arena, where you can actually use some tactics, especially your special attacks, how you order them up, uh, to really frag the enemy in the quickest time possible. There are boosted summons at the moment, so I'm going to summon some new champions with some shards I've got saved up. So what's new in Raid? Well, it's their anniversary. Raid's just hit their second anniversary with a load of anniversary events and tournaments going on right now. If you move quick, you'll still be able to catch some of those special events and get your hands on some free gifts and rewards. The schedule's absolutely jam-packed until the middle of April with insane anniversary events and tournaments with anniversary-sized prizes to win. You may still also be able to get involved in the very first ever Clan vs Clan tournament and get a chance to compete directly against another clan. On top of that, they've got some huge updates coming later in the month, including a new Doom Tower rotation with two tough new bosses. Raid's already huge, and with the whole anniversary event going on, it makes it an absolutely awesome time to get involved. So don't wait. If you want to get a huge head start in Raid, all you have to do is click the link in my description below, or the QR code on the screen now. And you'll get your free epic champion, Jotun, who's amazing for the Doom Tower, 100k silver, 50 gems, and three ancient shards, so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get into the game. All this treasure will be waiting for you up here in the inbox. These rewards are only available to new players and only for the next 30 days. 
You can find me in game as Captain Context, of course, and if you're quick enough, you can even join my clan. And it's as easy as that. Free to play, free to download. Just click on the link or scan the QR code and I will see you in game. So thanks for sticking with me. Now back to the main topic of the video, which are the five great um, fighting knives or daggers from history that I've chosen to feature in this video. So without any further ado, let's get on with number one. So number one is one of the most famous knives from history, actually, and it's also one of the most influential. It's been hugely important on influencing the design of modern knives. It's been used in modern fighting knives that are still in use with modern militaries. It's been used in bayonets. I'm sure you can guess it. It's the Bowie knife, or pronounced by many people, Bowie knife. I'm not going to get into the pronunciation debate, because it is a debate, but many of you will be familiar with the basic setup of what you imagine a Bowie or Bowie knife to look like. But the actual uh, history of them is a little bit more complicated, because, of course, uh, Jim Bowie, who's rather famous, um, and uh, his brother came up with a design of knife that we're not fully um, we're not fully certain of the origins of it. Now, um, it's described in some sources as a, as a butcher's knife, so it could have been something akin to a large carving knife. But one of the most important elements that gets added onto the early ones is a cross guard. And in fact, in the modern world, uh, when we're talking about you know hunting knives of any kind, field knives, um, camping knives, this is a very common setup to have a clipped point, uh, single edged. Sometimes this clipped point might be sharpened with a cross guard, and the grips can come in uh, various different styles. That's maybe not so important. One of the most iconic ones being the uh, coffin grip here. Now. What's, uh, what's interesting and intriguing about these is there's a lot of debate about the origin of these knives. My opinion is that probably the origin comes from various different knives. It probably comes partly from the large carving knife, the medieval knife. In fact, if we look back in uh, medieval art, we can see there are knives which have a clipped point. There are certain types of swords, falchions and uh, langmesser, as they're called, which also have clipped points. So the blade shape's nothing new. Uh, what's new is perhaps marrying a cross guard on a knife sides object to something with a clip point, but we also see so-called peasant knives or bandware, which have a similar setup. Um, so there are other influences as well. Um, so one of those could indeed be the um, uh, Spanish, or should we say Latin American, uh, Navaja, um, which is a particular type of blade which you'll, which you'll notice has a clipped point, which again, this goes all the way back to medieval knives, but a completely different style of hilt. And there are types of so-called gaucho knives as well, um, and uh, knives from South America, which may have influenced the uh, what we now see as the Bowie knife. But it's also important to mention that when the Bowie or Bowie knife was being made, in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, uh, the early Bowie knife sort of development, there wasn't only one uh, format. They didn't only have single edge clipped back points, they didn't uh, always have a cross guard, and they didn't only have one type of grip. We see various different sorts, and there's this famous Arkansas toothpick, which is usually associated with a double edged version. And the other thing that's important to mention is many people see this as an American knife, but a huge number of the antique examples that survive, even the ones that were sold in America and carried in America, were made in England. Uh, a huge number of them carry the made in Sheffield mark and were made in the northern part of England and exported to America. Some of them even with very patriotic um, emblems and, and motifs on them in the American Civil War to both the North and the South, so many people don't realise, but the British Empire supplied a huge number of firearms, swords, bayonets, um, and knives indeed, and various other um, hardware to both the North and the South during the US Civil War. So a huge number of English-made Bowie knives found their, found their way into American circulation and also influenced the designs going on there. So it's very difficult to disentangle where the Bowie knife uh, design that we're so familiar with today, with the clip point and the cross guard, actually physically started out. It may have had several different inspirations, but what we can say is it's a hugely important category of knives that has influenced basically all modern knives in use today. Also, just briefly to mention, although it's often seen, as I say, as an American knife, it influenced knives in other countries and other areas, geographic regions, and uh, the British had their own version of it that was used in uh, the British Raj in British India for hunting purposes, a very characteristic design. This is actually an Indian-made example for, um, for British hunters, so people hunting tigers and things like that, uh, and indeed in Latin 
America it was very much uh, adopted into this is Argentinian uh, knife the general overall sort of you know shape of this is very much inspired by American and British made Bowie knives as well so um, it was a type of knife that was hugely influential at the time and continues to be so. Now next up on my list of five great historical fighting knives is something that I suspect regular viewers of my channel will be extremely familiar with but generally is actually not very well known outside of the people who are already very interested in weapons and particularly in this case medieval weapons and that is the medieval rondel dagger. Now so called rondel dagger because it has a rondel, usually um, the, it has at least one rondel that's a guard and very often particularly on um, after the year 1400 it has a disc at the pommel end as well. In other words, your hand is locked in between these two discs and they come with various types of blades. I'll talk about the blade in a second. Now, going backwards, let's rewind to the context here. So within the medieval period, obviously you think knives and daggers were very common, but actually fighting knives weren't particularly common until about the 13th century when armor started to get more complete. So male armor was augmented with bits of plate. Uh, initially the coat of plates, which is a series of plates on the torso, uh, you start getting fully encompassed helmets and then gradually you start to get more plate added on the arms and legs as well. And this develops into the full plate harness or the suit of armor as most people would think of it uh, from movies and stuff. But the fact is that in this type of fighting weapons like swords and axes and spears are obviously very effective still but they're less effective than they were as the armor starts to build up and so a lot of the combat particularly single combats it has to be said duels and, and tournaments that were sometimes held uh, to the death or trial by combat and things like this were uh, getting closer and wrestling and grappling became more and more important and in this type of fighting, the dagger takes on a very important role. So whereas a knife has probably one of the most, most ancient weapons that has been used by mankind, a sharpened flint knife, um, a sharpened stick probably originally, um, in the medieval period, the knife, the civilian knife, the eating knife, just as now kitchen knives are the widest used type of knife in crime just today because they're widely available in every kitchen in every country. Um, just then that would have been the same. Everybody had eating knives, uh, so they used knives for eating and for their jobs and everything else. Um, so knives were undoubtedly used in fighting, but on the battlefield, the knight, the person wearing full armor, found that he needed a more specialized type of weapon. And so certain blades started to evolve that were more specialized towards thrusting and particularly towards uh, being thick and strong, a bit like a bayonet blade, so that you couldn't have a thin flat knife that would snap or bend very easily if it was getting jammed into mail or chain mail armor, or between the gaps of plates indeed. So you need a thick, strong blade that is also very, very pointy. Now don't think that the blade is necessarily used to punch straight through armor in every situation. Certainly you can't by hand uh, jam a, a blade through plate armor, um, at least not as far as I believe anyway, um, but you can possibly get it through mail if you're lucky and you can get it through gaps where there isn't any armor because it's between the articulations or are you getting under the armor or this kind of thing. So these are specialized weapons for fighting in armor, for bypassing the armor that's there in really in wrestling. Think about jujitsu, think about wrestling, grappling close in fighting where this is used to jam into gaps uh, and offend the person sort of underneath the armor or between the armor or in some cases perhaps through the armor. And that of course leads to the specialized grip as well. This does guard the hand, that is it is in principle a guard, but it's also there to give you a very very secure grip and keep your hand where it should be so there's no risk when you're applying a huge amount of force that there's no risk that your hand's sliding off this grip, but also Think about accessing the weapon. Imagine you're a knight in armor and you're uh, seeing through narrow vision slits. You can't necessarily see down to your weapons very easily and you're wearing gauntlets on your hands maybe. So with this kind of deprivation of senses, both sight and feel, 
having a grip which is a sure safe grip and we see grips like this on modern chisels and other types of tools as well so it's to keep your hand in place but it's also to enable you to easily get the hand into place in that split second when you need to pull the dagger out to fight so the medieval rondel dagger incredibly important weapon from history and very iconic and very distinctive design a specialized thrusting blade thick thrusting blade with these rondels uh, either side of your hand um, and it should be wider known than it is really because it was incredibly important in medieval history and was still being used in the 16th century uh, quite a lot um, so it had a relatively uh, decent lifespan of use and is an incredibly iconic design now next up we're staying with this concept of armor penetration or at least bypassing armor but we're moving to a completely different continent and to a degree a different period as well. We're moving to India. Imagine yourself in 16th, 17th, 18th century India and you're wearing a fair amount of armor. You're wearing, wearing male armor with little bits of plate, a plate helmet, and you're fighting an opponent with similar equipment. Your primary weapon is a curved sword known as a tulwa, or, or perhaps a spear in some situations, or perhaps even a bow. But you come to close combat and you come to wrestling. You need a specialized knife. You need a specialized dagger. And that's where the iconic katar comes into it. So the katar, sometimes known as a punch dagger, um, was a type of dagger or knife that was still in use in the 19th century um, still being made in the 19th century but really it's kind of a 16th 17th 18th century weapon really in the age uh, before um, gunpowder was universal in India um, so matchlock muskets were around in India from quite an early date in fact um, but the fact is that lots of Indian forces were still using traditional hand weapons there were lots of bows in use swords were still hugely used all the way up until the middle of the 19th century um, so the these types of weapons were still very important, particularly also as a sign of status. Now I spoke about the rondel dagger being associated with knights, and that's very important therefore to um, point out that status and prestige plays a part in this. So if you're the kind of person that wears armour, then you're a noble or at least a gentleman because you can afford it and that's how you that's how you're equipped and that's how you're being paid and indentured in warfare to fight as a knight or a man at arms so therefore you wear a rondel dagger so just wearing a rondel dagger even if you just wear a rondel dagger in your everyday civilian life denotes that you are of this knightly class and it was a, a similar implication in some ways perhaps in India as well although I have to say that the Qatar was much more widespread and we get many many different um, standards of Qatar so this is a fairly low to medium uh, quality so it's quite a quality but it's quite basic you see it doesn't have an awful lot of uh, decoration on it um, or anything like that we'll talk a bit more about the overall design of this and incidentally uh, my hand is probably slightly larger than the original user of this dagger so I can't I can just about fit all of my fingers in there, but it's a bit more comfortable if I just stick three in there, which you can still use it comfortably that way. Um, but if we move to a slightly higher status uh, version of it here, uh, this example actually has a blade made of woots, which is a type of crucible steel that was uh, similar to what was used in the old Viking Ulfbert swords. Uh, but woot steel was much higher status. You can see the pattern. It's sometimes known as watered steel. It looks like little ripples all over the surface. Um, and uh, it has the remains of silver decoration on it here applied uh, in a method that's called koftgari where you put little scarifications on the surface of the iron or steel and then you hammer onto the the silver or the gold depending which you're using uh, into patterns so this was covered in silver decoration not very much of which survives now because this is a, probably an 18th century example and the blade is woot so this is a higher status example so you could have higher status or lower status examples of Qatar but the basic basic design is the same and it involves a blade, we'll talk more about the blade in a second, two langettes or, or um, sort of splints that go along either side of the hand and uh, two, sometimes one, sometimes two, very occasionally three bars in the middle here uh, to grip. Now uh, what's interesting is that these bars either side give stability, they enable you to uh, make sure that the 
dagger still keeps pointing in the same direction. There are some references to these being bound to the hand as well, of course, although that would inhibit you from letting go of the weapon or grabbing other weapons or whatever. Usually these were worn in a sash at the belt, a bit like Japanese um, swords were worn, and they were much like the Ronald dagger used in the final moment of grappling distance when you came too close and you came into a clinch and you couldn't use your sword or your spear or your primary or secondary weapon easily anymore. This was the final uh, weapon of close in combat. And of course, being being aligned with the arm, very, very powerful punches. Now, I come back to the armoured context again. If you look at this blade, you can hopefully see um, that it is reinforced up here. So it's very, very thick. So actually the blade is thinner down here. It does have a, a reinforcing ridge up the centre, but the point is much, much thicker. It's exactly the same on this other higher status example here, where the uh, blade up here is very much thicker than down here. A bit like certain spearheads and halberd heads and rondel dagger points that we know that we used to aid them in, not only aid them in penetrating through um, types of armor, usually probably layers of clothing and padded armor, sometimes mail or chain mail, um, but also it makes them more durable, of course. If you're repeatedly stabbing at someone who's wearing armor, you're gonna damage your blade. So you want the blade to be thicker, and we see this with Japanese swords as well, you want to see the point to be thickened so that it can stand up to this sort of abuse and not break, because if your point breaks, you don't have a very useful uh, weapon anymore. Uh, so the Indian katar, very, very distinctive, used for centuries in India, and incredibly iconic, and in fact, it is the symbol uh, used in uh, various different um, Indian belief systems and organizations as well. So an incredibly iconic Indian weapon that really actually wasn't uh, directly emulated anywhere else. It's distinctively Indian, but used all over that enormous continent by a huge number of people for centuries presumably very successfully. Now we're gonna stay near India for number four knife. Uh, and in this case, we're gonna move slightly north to a country that was at some point uh, enemies actually of India and fought with um, armies from India and at other times was fighting armies from Persia. But equally, it took uh, a certain degree of cultural um, influence and sort of cross-pollination with both India and with Persia, now known as Iran, incidentally, and that is Afghanistan. So what I'm not gonna be talking about here is the very famous Kyber knife, okay? Now I have dealt with the Kyber knife in various videos of mine, and this was probably the most iconic uh, type of weapon found in Afghanistan, and this was emulated in uh, Persia, where actually probably it had its roots, um, and also it was um, emulated in India, and there are Indian versions of the Kyber knife. The British, believe it or not, also emulated the Kyber knife in various uh, utility knives and fighting knives that they made. And um, also, this is probably related to the development of the Ottoman Turkish Yatagan as well, and the Yatagan is found all over um, the, the Balkans and areas of Europe and a lot of Eastern Europe as well. So actually this uh, particular knife, although this is not the knife of this video, is connected with a whole bunch of other knives from all over, um, all over the world. But there was another type of uh, dagger that was carried in Afghanistan, which was related to this, very similar hilt construction, but with a distinctively different blade. And that is known by various terms, but I, for the purposes of this video, will call it a Pesh Cabs. Now the Pesh Cabs is a specialized very vicious looking pointy dagger. And you can see that the specific style of grip really locks into the hand. It can be held point up and it can be held uh, point down, but you'll see that it has a large uh, butt, so to speak, a large butt or pommel area there which means that much like the Ronald dagger, if you're trying to access it in the clinch, in the grapple, very, very close range, it's got that nice big butt you can grab hold of and get the point online as quickly as possible um, when you need to at that very, very close distance. So as mentioned, the uh, hilt construction of the Pesh cabs is, as you'll see, very, very similar to the more famous Kyber knife, which incidentally is more correctly known as a Chara or Chura. Um, and the, the construction method is basically the same, okay? But what is distinctive 
about the Pesh cabs is that the butt is very, very wide. Now that's interesting because we know from uh, looking at medieval treatises with the rondel dagger, which also has a large butt, that this is partly probably to do with accessing the weapon when you're in wrestling and maybe rolling around on the ground, but you're in very close in distance. So you can't necessarily look at the weapon or draw it in a more organized way. You need to quickly snatch it out of the uh, sheath or scabbard and deploy it. But also we know that uh, particularly with penetration, and we'll talk about the blade design in a second, it also means you can place your other hand on the back in a technique that the Italian fighting master Fiore de Liberi called Piofatezza uh, for applying, or rather this is a principle, um, of applying more force um, to the back uh, of here. And you can also do it to your arm as well, you don't need to do it to the butt, but there is some uh, artistic implication as well that this can be sometimes rested against the bre uh, breastplate um, uh, and used in that fashion, so it's to add more force to the back, perhaps, that's one theory anyway. Now onto the blade, you can see that this is very definitely sacrificed chop chopping or cutting potential for needle-like uh, penetration. But there's a more important aspect than just what you can see from this side. So you can see it scoops down here, sharp edge, needle-like point. But there is one characteristic thing to these Afghan uh, knives and daggers, which is really particular, which is the fact that they are very thick and T-sectioned. So whilst they're very thick at the back, you can see how thick that is there, that is like a spine running up the back, and it is there then hollow. It has this fuller, what some people would call a blood groove, but it's nothing to do with that, it's to do with reducing weight whilst keeping rigidity. So it's, think of an H-beam, eye girder, whatever you want to call it. So it's keeping rigidity with this thick T-section back, so if you imagine you cut through it, it would look like that, it would look like a T. So it's got that rigidity for stabbing. Now, the context, again, is similar to the Rondeldeo, similar to the Qatar. It's essentially a reinforced thrusting point because in Afghanistan, the um, nobility at least, wore armor. They wore male armor, just the same as in India and in Persia, incidentally, at this time. They wore the Kulakud helmet, they wore a, um, a full long-sleeved um, coat of male armor which came down the legs. Sometimes they wore felt full male chainmail trousers and they often had plate armor elements added on top of that as well. So this is really a penetrating dagger. Now you might be thinking, well what about the people not in armour? Because they did carry these as well. Yeah, I've just put that down for a second. So this is a relatively low, low to medium status example. I've got a higher status example here with a more decorated sheath and it has ivory um, grips and a decorated blade and a silver um, escutcheon part, uh, ferrule. And, um, the fact is that these were very, very common for everyone to carry, but you have to think about Afghanistan and think about the context of the country, the weather, what they're wearing. And the Afghans were famous, particularly in the 18th, 19th century, when we have lots of British sources talking about them, for wearing very heavy clothing, because it can get incredibly cold in Afghanistan. And they wore an item called a poshteen, which is essentially a sheepskin jacket where the fur is on the inside, the leather's on the outside. And it was famously difficult to cut through. So these types of daggers, not only are they good for maybe bypassing armor, but they're also very important for getting just through the clothes of the day. And we should mention that when we come back to other dagger types, whether it's the Indian Qatar or the uh, European Rondel dagger, that when we're talking about penetration, I think we fixate on armor sometimes, but also clothing plays a big part. So if you've got thick woolen clothing uh, or leather and these kind of things, then you need a dagger which is gonna be able to get through those in order to be effective. So I think the Afghan Pesh Cabs de deserves to be on this list of five great historical fighting knives. So the last of my five great historical fighting knives, and this one I think, if you know anything about my channel, couldn't have not been on this list, uh, but I've left it for last, but definitely not least, and it is the famous uh, knife of Nepal, um, commonly associated with the Gurkhas, uh, because it is their uh, sidearm, and that is the Kukri, as it's called, or Kukri, probably more correctly uh, pronounced, spelt in various ways. Um, but this is the iconic weapon of um, Nepal. And of course, therefore, because the Gurkhas are in both the British Army 
and the Indian armies. Um, it has been used extensively in the British army and in the, uh, uh, Nepal, uh, in the Nepalese army and in the uh, Indian army as well. And of course, a lot of people who are interested in World War One and World War Two will know all about these knives because these knives were used uh, by the Gurkhas in both those world wars. They were used, um, you know, in a battle against the Japanese. They were used um, in Europe against the Germans and the Italians and such like. So the the it has a very poignant 20th century relevance. But going further back into history, this is like the national emblem, pretty much of. Nepal and this weapon was being used certainly by the 16th century. Now um, there, there is a lot written on the internet about the origin of the cookery and I've looked into this to some degree myself and I may indeed do uh, videos in the future where I talk about my ideas on the origin of this but the fact is actually that we're not actually sure exactly when the cookery developed in Nepal. Um, some websites will claim that uh, this has, in fact many books will claim that this has its origins in some of the swords used by Alexander the Great, no less, um, the so-called copis um, or weapons like the falcata. I think the problem is what we've got here is um, convergent evolution. We, we, just because a certain blade type works or blade shape works doesn't mean that those two blades necessarily evolved together or in an interrelated way. Um, and I think that's what we have here. The fact is that I think we don't have particularly ancient origins for the cookery uh, in what's now Nepal, um, but we certainly have medieval origins for it. So in fact, if we look at certain other types of knife and sword being used in India, um, around uh, let's say 1,000 years ago, we do see probably what were the ancestors of what became the cookery later. Now there are some very peculiar, and I've done lots of videos about the cookery so I won't go into a huge amount of depth here. Let's just put the sheath aside for a second. There are some, apart from the obvious shape of the blade, there are some other peculiar um, aspects of the design of the um, cookery. And I should mention also, the cookery is a fighting knife and is a tool, and it fulfills both. And in fact, the Nepalese did have a sword called the Kora, and the Kora follows the same principle of having a forwards curved blade. So clearly in Nepal, they, and I have to say in India before the arrival of the backwards curved blade in the 16th century, um, they were fans of forwards curved blades. And these are very, very powerful choppers, very, very potent choppers. But these were used and still are used in Nepal for everything from um, hunting to uh, just doing stuff with wood you know, chopping wood occasionally and uh, to fighting with. And there are different types of cookeries. Not all cookeries are the same. Some are clearly more fighting weapons. Some are clearly more tools. Um, so they can, and many of them are both. Um, so some peculiarities of the construction of the cookery, apart from uh, the shape. The first thing we have to mention, because it always gets talked about, is that. Over the years, people have come up with many weird and wacky ideas for what this um, Cho um, notch down here is for. Everything from opening bottles to things to do with uh, horses, to do with throwing as a site for throwing it, to all sorts of weird and wacky ideas. That, and also bloodletting as well, which is, but you've got a sharp edge up here. None of these things make sense, uh, but basically it's probably a, a religious significance. If you want to find out more about that, then just search in my videos for the word cookery. Another peculiar or particular aspect of the cookery's design is that it doesn't have any guard to speak of. Uh, but it, what it does have, certainly on the traditional ones, is you have a rib around the middle of the grip here. And what's interesting is that locks between the two upper and two lower fingers and prevents the hand from being able to slide up. So uh, many of you uh, will know that many knives and daggers have guards on them uh, and those guards aren't always to protect your hand from the opponent's weapon or anything like that. They're very often there just to prevent your hand from sliding onto the blade during use. So the cookery has thought of a, a different way of achieving this same goal. Because of the cookery's formidable reputation, particularly in the hands of the Gurkhas, it's been incredibly influential on all sorts of other knives and machete uh, and you know fighting knives, utilitarian knives, all around the world, even camp knives and tools. So um, in fact, probably together with the uh, Bowie knife, this has had 
as much or um, certainly if not maybe as much it's had a significant probably second after the Bowie knife um, influence on designs of modern knives that are being made today um, because of the formidable reputation of its chopping um, capacity. So the cookery whether it's the historical cookery or the modern cookery is an incredibly important um, historical fighting knife that I think very much deserves to be on this list of five. So there you go, there were my five for this video. Clearly there are dozens of um, other famous and significant, historically significant and important fighting knives that could have been on this list. Those are just the five that I picked out um, to keep this video relatively concise and also where I had um, examples of those to show. I definitely think the Roman Pugio, uh, the uh, Japanese Tanto, various types of Filipino knife, uh, the um, Jambia for example and the Kanjar which are related, um, the Chris, there's various types of knife and dagger which definitely could have deserved to be on this list. Tell us about your favourites, I'd be interested to hear what you would like to see. Maybe if I do another one of these, if I do a follow-up like another five, uh, five knives, what would you like to see on there? And it doesn't need to be something that I've got an example of. What do you think, if you're, if you're telling people who maybe don't know that much about the history of knives and daggers, if you're telling them about iconic and important historical uh, knives and daggers that have existed and that still influence us today, what would be on your list and I look forward to seeing your comments below. As always, thanks for watching, thanks to our sponsors, give us a like and a subscribe and share this video if you care to. I hope you'll come back for more and I'll see you again soon for another video on Scala Gladiatoria channel. Cheers folks! Thanks for watching, we've got extra videos on Patreon, please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks!